Hello everyone, here I am, your English friend, with a new video explaining part C of sample 2 reading passage released on OET official website. Let's get started. Question number 7. What point is made about the death of a female patient called Mary? Here the answer is A, which says it was entirely preventable. As we go through the paragraph, we can see, in a well-documented case in number 2004, a female patient called Mary was admitted to a hospital in Seattle, USA. As we read further in the third line, the patient was mistakenly injected with the antiseptic chlorhexidine. It happened, the hospital says, because of the confusion over the three identical stainless steel bowls in the procedure room containing clear liquids. So it was a mistake. If they had avoided the confusion that occurred in the procedure room, death of Mary could have been avoided. So option A is perfectly right. It was entirely preventable. Option B says nobody was willing to accept the blame. It's wrong because here you may see hospital says it happened because of the confusion over the three identical stainless steel bowls in the procedure room. So they are accepting their mistakes. So option B is contradicting the information which can be found in the paragraph. So it's wrong. Option C says surgeons should have tried harder to save her life, which means they didn't try much to save her life. But here in the last part, you may see doctors tried amputating one of Mary's legs to save her life, but the damage to her organs was too great. So they tried. So option C is wrong. Option D says it is the type of incident which is becoming increasingly common. It is not mentioned anywhere in this paragraph. So that's clearly a not given. Question number eight. What is meant by the phrase effort substitution in the second paragraph? Here you may see this and similar incidents are what inspired Professor Dixon Woods of the University of Cambridge, UK to set out on a mission uh, to improve patient safety. It is, she admits, going to be a challenge. Many different policies and approaches have been tried to date, but few with widespread success and often with unintended consequences. Financial incentives are widely used, but recent evidence suggests that they have little effect, which means almost zero effect. There is a danger that they tend to encourage effort substitution, explains Dixon Woods. In other words, people concentrate on areas that are being incentivized but neglect other areas. It's not even necessarily conscious neglect. People have only limited amount of time. So it is inevitable they focus on areas that are measured and rewarded, which means Staff focus their attention on a limited number of issues. They do focus on those areas where they are getting paid and they intentionally or unintentionally neglect other areas. So your answer is C. Option A says monetary resources are devoted unnecessarily. No, there is no such information mentioned anywhere that uh, the financial incentives are uh, devoted unnecessarily. So that's not given. Uh, option B says time and energy are wasted on irrelevant matters. Again, staff, when they focus on particular area, they are not telling that those areas are irrelevant. So option B is also a wrong one. Option D, people have to take on tasks which they are unfamiliar with, something which has not been mentioned anywhere in the paragraph. So that's not given clearly. Question number nine. By quoting Dixon Woods in the second paragraph, the writer shows that the professor, here the answer is A, which says understands why healthcare employees have to make certain choices. As we go through the paragraph, here you may see the words of Dixon Woods quoted by a writer. There is a danger that they tend to encourage effort substitution, explains Dixon Woods. They tend to. Here they are talking about the financial incentives that are widely used. So our writer says, in other words, people concentrate on areas that are being incentivized but neglect other areas. It is not even necessarily conscious neglect. Writer says, staff have, have only a limited amount of time, so it is inevitable. They focus on areas that are measured and rewarded. So our writer understands why healthcare employees have to make certain choices here. And that is the reason why our writer has quoted the words of Dixon Woods. Now option B says, doubts whether reward schemes are likely to put patients at risk. No, reward schemes are not putting any patients at risk. 
So that is actually a wrong thing and that is not the reason why our writer has quoted Dixon Woods words over here. It is done to explain why the healthcare employees have to make certain choices because there are some areas where they are getting paid and other areas where they are not paid and because of the lack of time they have got, they unintentionally uh, get inclined towards those areas where they get financial incentives. Option C says, believe staff should be paid off, uh, paid a bonus for achieving goals, which is not mentioned anywhere, so that's clearly not given. Option D says, feels the people in question have made poor choices. That is, again, a not given. Nothing has been mentioned anywhere like this in this paragraph. Question number 10. What point is made about checklists in the third paragraph? You may see in 2013, Dixon Woods and colleagues published a study evaluating the use of surgical checklists introduced in hospitals to reduce complications and deaths during surgery. Her research found that the checklist may have little impact and in some situations might even make things worse. The checklist sometimes introduced new risks. Nurses would use the list as a box ticking exercises. They would tick the box to say the patient had had their antibiotics when there were no antibiotics in the hospital, for example. So here, in reality, there are no antibiotics in the hospital, but the nurses might be ticking the box to say the patient that they had their antibiotics. So this could be different from the reality which has been given in option D. The information recorded on them does not always reflect reality. That's why it's D. Now let's consider the other three options. Option A, hospital staff sometimes forget to complete them. No information like that given anywhere in this paragraph. Option B, nurses and surgeons are both reluctant to deal with them. Again, something which has not been mentioned anyway here. Nurses are not reluctant at all. Option C, there are an additional burden for overworked nursing staff. Again, they have not specified any overworked nurses here. No information regarding any sort of additional burden as well. So option, a, option C is also not given. Question number 11. What problem is mentioned in the fourth paragraph? Here you may see Dixon Woods and her team spend time in hospitals to try to understand which systems are in place and how they are used. Not only does she find differences in approaches between hospital, but also between units and even between shifts. So it is quite apparent here that she finds certain differences in approaches, certain differences in approaches between hospitals and even between units and even between the shifts. Standardization and harmonization are two of the most urgent issues we have to tackle. Imagine if you have to learn each new system wherever you go or even whenever a new senior doctor is on the ward. This introduces massive risk. So we may understand here that there are certain differences in the approaches between hospitals, unit and shifts and there is no consistency. That's why answer is T. Lack of consistency. Things are not consistent. They always differ. Option A says failure to act promptly. No, nothing has been mentioned. Outdated procedures, clearly not given. Poor communication, no, they're not talking anything about any sort of communication here. It's all about the differences in the approach and uh, the two most urgent issues are standardization and harmonization. And here in the last part, they're talking about, of, uh, talking about learning each new system wherever you go, whenever a senior doctor comes in. Now question number 12. What point about patient safety is the writer making by quoting Dixon Woods comparison with climate change? As we go through the paragraph, we may find Dixon Woods compares the issue of patient safety to that of climate change in the sense that it is a problem of many hands with many factors, each making a contribution towards the outcome. Climate change occurs because of many factors and Dixon Woods is comparing patient safety to it, which means patient safety is also the outcome of many factors and here it says because of this reason there is a difficulty in identifying what is responsible for solving the problem or in other words it is not clear who is responsible to tackle the situation and that is why option b is the right answer option a says the problem will worsen if it is not dealt with soon no they're not telling anything about uh, the problem getting worse if it is not dealt soon. So that's not given. 
Option C says, it is hard to know what the best course of action is. It is not about the best cause of action. It is about where to find the responsibility for solving the problem or who should be uh, considered as responsible for tackling the situation. Option D says, many people refuse to acknowledge there is a problem. No, nothing has been given anywhere like that. So option D is clearly not given. Question number 13. The writer calls Dixon Woods reference to intensive care births in order to. The here the answer is B, which says illustrate a fundamental obstacle. Now, when we go through the paragraph, we can see nowhere is this more apparent than the issue of a lymphatic, according to Dixon Woods. Each bed in an intensive care unit typically generates 160 alarms per day caused by machinery that is not integrated. You have to assemble all the kit around an intensive care bed manually, she explains. It doesn't come built as one like an aircraft cockpit. This is not something a hospital can solve alone. It needs to be solved at the sector level. So a hospital alone cannot find a solution for this problem. It should be solved at the sector level or in other words, it should be solved at the foundation level, which is the very same thing that can be found in option B. Illustrate a fundamental obstacle. It is not the obstacle which has to be dealt uh, by the hospital alone. It should be faced or confronted by the whole sector. They need to find a solution at the sector level. So that's a fundamental obstacle. Option A says, present an alternative viewpoint. No, there is no other viewpoint. The, uh, she is just ex explaining a particular problem which should be dealt at the fundamental level or a foundation level. Option C says, show the drawbacks of seemingly simple solutions again. No, this is not a solution. Option D says, give a detailed example of how to deal with an issue. Again, there is no information. There, there is no example shown here which deals with an issue. It is just mentioned here that it should be solved at the sector level, but there is no explanation regarding how to deal this issue. So option D is also wrong. Question number 14, what difference between healthcare engineering is mentioned in the final paragraph. Here the answer is D, which says the approach they take to deal with challenges. As we go through the paragraph, we can find Dixon Woods has turned to Professor Clarkson in Cambridge Engineering Design Center to help. Fundamentally, my work is about asking how we can make it better and what could possibly go wrong, explained Clarkson. We need to look through the eyes of the healthcare providers to see the challenges and to understand where tools and techniques we can we use in engineering may be of value. There is a difficulty, he concedes. There is no formal language of design in healthcare. That's the difference, first difference. Do we understand what the need is? Do we understand what the requirements are? Can we think of a range of concepts we might use and then design a solution and test it before, test it before we put it in place? We seldom see this in healthcare. And that's partly driven by culture and lack of training, but partly by lack of time. So this is the difference here. They don't have these kind of uh, formal language of design in healthcare as the engineer or the engineering has. So that's the difference. It is the approach they take to deal with challenges. Option A is the types of systems they use. No, they're not talking about any sort of systems here. So that is not given. Option B says the way they exploit technology, there is no explanation on how engineering exploits technology. So that's also not given. The nature of difficulties they face. And here they have not given any statement which actually describes the kind of difficulties engineering faces. So that is also clearly not given. Question number 15. Why does the writer tell the story of the news reporter? Here the answer is C. It says, to illustrate the strange nature of migraine aura. As we go through the paragraph here, you can see when a news reporter in the US gave an unintelligible live TV commentary of an award ceremony, she became an overnight internet sensation. As we go through the following lines, we will understand what she went through and what the situation was. And here you may see the bizarre speech difficulty she experienced are uncommon symptom of aura, uncommon symptom of aura. And the collective name for a range of neurological symptoms that may occur just before a migraine headache. 
Generally, aura is visual, for example, blind spots which increase in size or having a flashing, zigzagging or sparkling margin, but they can include other old disturbances such as pins and needles, memory changes and even partial paralysis. So here, they are mainly talking about the uncommon symptoms of aura that happened in this particular situation. So this situation has been reported or the story of the news reporter has been elaborated in this paragraph to explain the uncommon nature or the bizarre nature of migraine aura which can be found in option C to illustrate the strange nature of migraine aura. Option A says to explain the causes of migraine aura which cannot be found anywhere in this paragraph that's clearly not given. They have not specified, they have not mentioned any causes of migraine aura here. Option B says to address the fear surrounding migraine aura. Again, no information regarding any sort of fear surrounding migraine aura. So that's also clearly not given. Option D says to clarify a misunderstanding about migraine aura. Another option which is not mentioned. There is no mister misunderstanding which is surrounding the migraine aura mentioned in this paragraph so that is also wrong one question number 16 the research by noshin hajikani into csd here the answer is b did not result in a definitive conclusion as we go through the paragraph here you may see migraine is often thought as an occasional severe headache but surely symptoms such as these should tell us there is more to that it than meets the eye. In fact, many scientists now consider it a serious neurological disorder. As we come down here, they are talking about cortical spreading, depression, a storm of neural activity that passes in a wave across the brain surface. First seen in 1944 in the brain of rabbit, it's now known that CSD can be triggered when the normal flow of electric currents within and around brain cells is somehow reversed. From here onwards, Nasheen Hajikani and her team at Harvard Medical School managed to record an episode of CSD in a brain scanner during migraine aura in a visual region that responds to flickering motion. Having found a patient who had the rare ability to be able to predict when an aura would occur. This confirmed a long suspected link between CSD and the aura that often precedes migraine pain. Hajikani admits, however, that other work she has done suggests that CSD may occur all over the brain, often unnoticed and may even happen in healthy brains, which means not only in the brains which have got the issue of migraine. It could happen even in healthy brains. If so, aura may be the result of a person's brain being more sensitive to CSD than it should be, which means this research that she has conducted into CSD has not provided a proper conclusion on this topic, which is what you can find in option B. It did not result in a definitive conclusion because this could happen in healthy brains as well. Option A says has less relevance than many believe. There is no information regarding its relevance and what other people believe anywhere in this paragraph so that's clearly not given option option c says was complicated by technical difficulties again something which has not been mentioned anywhere so that's also not given overturned years of accepted knowledge no this research didn't bring down any accepted knowledge so we cannot really say it overturned anything so option d is also wrong number 17 what does the word this in the second paragraph refer to it is in the same paragraph that we have read for question number 16 here you may see Nusheen Hajikani and her team Harvard Medical School managed to record an episode of CSD in a brain scanner during migraine aura in a visual region that responds to flickering motion having found a patient who had the rare ability to be able to predict when an aura would occur this confirmed a long suspected link between CSD and the aura that often precedes migraine pain. And here the answer is C which says the simultaneous occurrence of CSD and aura which can be found here. Here they managed to record an episode of CSD in a, in a brain scanner which actually happened during a migraine aura. And this happened 
They were able to do this because they found a patient who has got the ability, which is very rare, to predict when an aura is about to occur. Since they got this patient who has got this ability, they were able to record the CSD in a brain scanner at the same time when a migraine aura occurred. And this simultaneous occurrence is what referred by the term this in this paragraph. That's why option C is the answer. Option A says the theory that connects CSD and aura. It can never be the answer because here it is clear this confirmed a long suspected link between CSD and the aura. So the link between CSD and the aura was confirmed by what is referred by the term this. So in order to know what the term this refers to, you need to read these areas over here. And from there, you would definitely get it's all about the simultaneous occur occurrence of CSD and the aura. Option B says the part of the brain where auras take place. This also is not the answer, even though they have mentioned about a region here, uh, in a visual region that responds to flickering motion. This was the area where the migraine aura took place, but this is not what is represented by the term this in this paragraph. So that can never be the answer. Option D says the ability to predict when an aura would happen. No. We may doubt that that could be the answer, but when you go through this portion, it is quite clear that since they were able to find a person who has got that ability, they were able to record something, two different things at the same time, episode of CSD and migraine aura. And this was possible only because of the rare ability of that patient. So because of this simultaneous occurrence, they were able to confirm a long suspected, long suspected link between CSD and the aura that often precedes migraine pain. So this confirmed. What confirmed? It is the simultaneous occurrence, not the ability to predict. That's why option D is wrong. Question number 18. The implication of Hadjikani's research into somatosensory cortex is that. Here the answer is A. Migraine could cause a structural change. This question is kind of direct. And uh, we can find in the paragraph that Hajikani has also been looking into the structural and functional differences in the brains of migraine sufferers. She and her team found thickening of a region known as the somatosensory cortex which maps a sense of touch in different parts of the body. They found the most significant changes in the region that relates to the head and face. Because sufferers return to normal following an attack, migraine has always been considered an episodic problem, says Hajikani. But we found that if you have successive strikes of pain in the face area, it actually increases cortical thickness. Cortical thickness increases. It means the structural change occurs there, which is exactly what you can find in option A. Migraine could cause a structural change. So increase in cortical thickness is, is, a, is a structural change. That's why option A is the answer. Option B says the lasting treatment of migraine is possible. No information. Option C says some diagnosis of migraine may be wrong. That is also clearly not given. Option D says having one migraine is likely to lead to more. That's kind of obvious because here they have clearly given because sufferers return to normal following an attack. Migraine has always been considered an episodic problem. So definitely after one episode of migraine, the next one is very much likely to happen. It's kind of obvious. However, that is not what the question is. Question is asking about the, the implication of Hadjikani's research into the somatosensory cortex. So here, they're talking about the cortex and here in the last line they could the, you could see increase in the cortical thickness so that's the structural change so that's the implication that's why option d is wrong and option a is right question number 19 what does the writer find surprising about god's by its research here the answer is d which says the suggestion that infant colic may be linked to migraine as we go through the paragraph we can uh, find the fact that work with children is also providing some startling insights. A study by migraine expert Peter Gotspai, who splits his time between King's College of London and the University of California, San Francisco, looked at the prevalence of migraine in mothers of babies with colic. The uncontrolled crying and fussiness often blamed on sensitive stomachs or reflex. He found that of 154 mothers whose babies were having a routine two-month checkup, the migraine sufferers were 2.6 times as likely to have baby with colics. So there is a connection here. Mothers with migraine 
to have baby with colic. Godspy believes it is possible that a baby with a tendency to migraine may not cope well with the barrage of sensory information they experience as their nervous system starts to mature and the distress response could be what we call colic. And that's the very same thing that we can find in option D, the suggestion that infant colic may be linked to migraine. Yes, we can find that link here. Migraine sufferers were 2.6 times as likely to have baby with colic. Now, option A says the idea that migraine may not run in families. That's not the point that they are dealing here. It's they're just talking about the connection between infant colic and uh, mothers who are migraine sufferers. Option B says the fact that migraine is evident in the infanthood. No, that can never be the answer. No information regarding that. Option C, the link between childbirth and the onset of migraine. Again, no. Question number 20. According to Marla Mickelborough, what is unusual about the brain of migraine sufferers? Unusual. Here the answer is A, it fails to filter out irrelevant details. And that can be found clearly in this paragraph. Linked to this idea, researchers are finding differences in the brain function of migraine sufferers, even between attacks. Marla Mikkelbro, a vision specialist at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada, found heightened sensitivity to visual stimuli in the supposedly normal period between attacks. Usually, the brain comes to recognize something repeating over and over again as unimportant and stops noticing it. But... In people with migraine, the response does not diminish over time. They seem to be attending to things they should be ignoring. So what can be called those things that must be ignored or that should be ignored? Irrelevant details. So sufferers, they seem to be attending those irrelevant details or those irrelevant things. And that is the very same thing that you can find here in option A. It fails to filter out irrelevant details. It means it seems to attend things that are irrelevant. Now option B. Option B says it struggles to interpret visual input. No, it says it struggles to interpret. But here you may see if they found heightened sensitivity to, to visual stimuli in the supposedly normal period between attacks. So they're not struggling to interpret. They have got a heightened sensitivity rather than struggling to interpret. So option B cannot be right. Option C said it is slow to respond to sudden changes. No such information. Option D, it does not pick up on the important information. They have given us the information not about picking up important information, but about picking up unimportant information. So this is something which has not been mentioned in the paragraph. So that is clearly not given. Question number 21. The writer uses the phrase a silver lining in the final paragraph to emphasize. Here in the last paragraph, we may see taken together, this research is worrying and suggests that it's time for doctors to treat the condition more aggressively and to find out more about each individual's triggers so as to stop attacks from happening. But there is a silver lining. The structural changes should not be likened to dementia, Alzheimer's disease or aging where brain tissue is lost or damaged irreparably. In migraine, the brain is compensating. Even if there is a genetic predisposition, research suggests it is the disease itself that is driving networks to an altered state. That would suggest that treatments that reduce the frequency of severity of migraine will probably be able to reverse some of the structural changes too. And that's a positive side. That's a reason to hop. The treatments used to reduce the frequency or the severity of a migraine is not only really doing that, it will probably be able to reverse some of the structural changes as well per, as per the information here. Treatments used to be all about reducing the immediate pain but now it seems they might be able to achieve a great deal more and that's the silver lining. The treatments meant to just all alleviate the severity of migraine might be able to reverse the structural changes or they may be able to achieve a great deal more as per the last line. So here the answer is B, a more positive aspect of the research. So this is the positive after the thing that we just read. So that's why answer is B. Option A says the privileged position of some sufferers. 
No, they are not talking about some sufferers and they are not, they, there is no information regarding any sort of privileged position anywhere in this paragraph. So that's a wrong option. Option C says the way migraine affects all the people. No, they're not dealing with a particular group of people. Here in the first line, they are, they are telling us to find out more about each individual struggle so as to stop attacks from happening. So they're not targeting a particular group of people and you cannot find anything about all the people in this paragraph. So that is also an irrelevant option, a wrong one. Option D, the value of publicizing the research. Again, no information, clearly not given. Number 22, what does the writer suggest about the brain changes seen in migraine sufferers? We have already read this paragraph for the previous question, question number 21, and we found that in the last part that uh, the treatments that reduce the frequency of severity of migraine would probably be able to reverse some of the structural changes too. Treatment used to be all about reducing immediate pain, but now it seems they might be able to achieve great deal more. So as per this information, the structural changes are never going to be permanent. They are likely to get reversed. So here, option B, you may see they are unlikely to be permanent. And that's the very same thing we can find in the paragraph. They, these structural changes might be getting reversed because of these treatments. So that's why option B is the answer here. Option A says some of them may be beneficial. Some of them, some of the brain changes may be beneficial. No such information. Some of them or some of the brain changes make treatment unnecessary. Again, completely irrelevant. Option D says brain changes should still be seen as a cause, of, cause for concern. Again, no such information has been mentioned anywhere in this paragraph. So that's clearly not given. So option B is the right one. If you like this video, Please let me know about it through the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You may click the bell icon to get prompt updates. Thank you for watching.